Our guest spot for this unit is Professor Luis Betancourt. Luis is a resident professor at the Santa Fe Institute. His background is in theoretical physics, but like many of the Santa Fe Institute faculty, he's worked in a lot of different fields, ranging from computational neuroscience to epidemiology. Much of his current work is focused on studying cities as complex systems. So welcome, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So Luis, in this course, we've covered metabolic scaling. We've mm -hmm. talked to Jeffrey West. Mm -hmm. And now we're looking at how complex system science is being applied to studying cities. But mm -hmm. let me ask, why do you think it's useful to view cities as complex systems? Well, I think most people that thought even just a little bit about cities know that they are complex systems in this way we just described, in that um, they obviously look like they vary a lot. They're made of many different pieces. They look all very different. They're poor parts of the city, rich parts of the city, parts of the city dedicated to some kinds of businesses or others. So there's a lot of diversity, however, in, in whichever way you measure them. Uh, that that makes the city look very diverse. They also they also share with some other complex systems the fact that cities by and large are open ended. So we've had cities certainly for now, well over ten thousand years, and there's something recognizable about cities old and new. But they also have evolved obviously in terms of technology, in terms of what it is that people do, and so uh, because of all this, I think um, cities are not just something that you can study from. Uh, their economic consequences, their social consequences, this, the way they are, they live in space and occupy space or structure space. So all these things need to come together, social life, uh, economic and material life, energy, but also the way the city exists in space and in time because cities increasingly now with large suburbanized cities, we have cities that exist also in time. When people come together during the day and then disappear again at night as people go back home. So, so they really have the hallmark of something that, um, that, that evolves, not in terms of biological evolution, but in terms of things that we still struggle in the social sciences to define what evolution is. Uh, and also, perhaps most importantly, create uh, uh, new diversity, new ideas, new spatial forms uh, that reflect what we can do as a species when we, we, when we come together in large numbers in terms of our social life. So the reason I like cities is that all these things come together into the same problem. Okay, well, it's interesting that you use the term evolution. You know, we've talked about yeah. evolution in a lot of different contexts in this course, and um, you know, you say cities evolve, maybe not in a biological sense, but in some mm -hmm. sense. And um, people in the past have certainly characterized cities as being sort of like organisms. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, I guess one question is, are cities alive, or does it even make sense to talk about mm -hmm. it in those terms? They are not like an organism, but, but they evolve, whereas an organism per se does not evolve. So other people, for example, compare cities to ecosystems. Famously, Jane Jacobs did this in The Economy of Cities. In the sense that an ecosystem has uh, you know, organisms and species that um, reflect certain uh, properties, um, functional properties, perhaps functions, that those creatures have in their niche. But the, it's the interaction of all these different functions that create the ecosystem. And in a city, it's a little bit like that, though, with all the things that you need to change changed, in that the city only really exists as you have this division of labor between people, division of functions, and their integration back together. So that out of scale, this increasing diversity and the productivity increases that, that division of labor and coordination of labor and co-location permits. You can have a system that evolves in that sense that at least superficially is like biological evolution that create new things. Right? So in that sense, the city is, is probably, in terms of human systems, the ultimate complex system. But it is a system that's very interesting when we compare different complex systems in that there's a certain amount of um, uh, the creation of new things and the selection of those things, both of which occur, of course, also in biology, that become endogenous, that become part of the city itself. That's why the city evolves as a whole, just like, in some sense, an ecosystem, though by a very different means. Whereas an organism does not, it only has a very limited way of creating new information, which, of course, through reproduction, which is mostly random, and then the selection is done at the level of the environment. Okay. Um, let me ask a slightly different question. I, we, we've looked a lot at s scaling, different scaling laws and... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, particularly in the context of metabolic scaling so far, yes. 
And I know you've done a lot of work on scaling laws in cities. So, so let me ask first, uh, what do you see as the main sort of new thing that you've discovered that hasn't been known before? What we know now is essentially, um, in a nutshell, that cities are basically social reactors. They're sort of open-ended places where a lot of people can come together and interact with each other. And when things go well and, and, and uh, necessary organizations and technologies come together, they're places where we can do lots of good things together in terms of having new ideas, producing things that are economically more productive, and so forth. But of course, we can also do a lot of bad things. So. What I mean by that is that there are places where a lot of people can interact, react with each other, and create things that we can only create socially. There's, there's sort of a famous um, quote by Yo Wilson, and he's very interested in ants, and he calls a set of ants uh, an ant colony superorganism in, ter- in the sense that even in genetic terms, they're of course very related, and that's part of the explanation for their sociality. But uh, he says that an ant alone is a disappointment. You only find what ants can do when you understand how, how the colony works. But to a much larger extent, you could say that a human alone is a little bit of a disappointment. Hmm. And it's when you actually find ways of integrating a lot of what humans can do uh, uh, together that, um, that you understand what we can do in terms of our, our creativity, our originality, and, deal, and how we deal with also with resources. And that's what cities are. Cities are technologies to do just that. When people look, when you look at organisms versus cities, you find this interesting distinction, which is subtle, but it's all important, which is that uh, by and large, the way we understand organisms, and to some extent also river networks, which may be something that you covered in your lectures, I'm not sure, yeah. is that these are systems that exist in some sense to preserve information, uh, or, or certainly organisms, the information is already there in the genome. But then they want to do that using the least amount of energy possible, and they form these networks that reach all parts of the organism that allow you to do that. In a city, as I just described, it's a little different, because in some sense you want to uh, enable this reactivity of people and organizations. So you want to have people move around. Your cells in your body don't move around and conspire to do new things. Mm. In fact, when they try to do that, you kill them. Right. There are many mechanisms to kill them. You hopefully you don't want kill them, right. Anything inside the organism. <laughs> exactly. So what happens in cities is that it's the opposite in that you need to promote all these interactions. It's out of that recombination of these heterogeneous elements that have different information that new ideas, new organizational forms come about. In order for a city to promote that, it still needs to occupy, in this case, cities live in space. So you need to have networks that allow you to cover all the space. And that's the sense in which these networks bear some resemblance to those in biology for an organism that also need to irrigate all parts of space. But in these networks, what you have is, by and large, information. People carrying information, interacting with each other, and creating new things. And that form of transport actually takes more energy, so it's less efficient than the organism but also creates an output that is greater. So this is what we call superlinear. So you find essentially this superlinear output in terms of uh, products of social reactions like ideas, innovation, wealth, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you also buy a superlinear amount of energy, not so much in the network, which actually tends to be spatially smaller, just like in an organism a little bit, but because in that smaller network you need to move more things around faster. Right. And that ends up creating more dissipation. And when you say super linear, you mean when you look at the um, some functionality with respect to the size of the city, right? Yes. So, so in some sense, what you find is that super linear just means that if you measure some property of the city, let's say it's uh, GDP or it's number of crimes, and if you say and you look at cities that you think are comparable, usually inside the same nation but across different sizes. So you have small cities, medium cities, large cities, and you ask how that property varies with the number of people in the city, with the population, then you mm-hmm. find that typically socioeconomic things increase faster than population. So its per capita rates go up, and this is why large cities are more expensive, but also people earn more money, often they're more dangerous, and so forth. That's basically this, this characteristic, which is essentially an acceleration on the rate of these socioeconomic um, interactions, right. this reactivity. So the reactor is basically getting a little hotter in some <laughs> sense, uh, much like a star. I like to use sometimes the analogy of a star. It's a lot like a star. 
Hmm. But when we have more mass, the reactions at the center are faster, and the star is hotter, and everything's faster. Uh -huh. In that respect, it's a lot like a star, though quantitatively it's a little different because the physics and the social dynamics are different. What do you get out of predicting all this? What kinds of applications are there of all this measurement? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is just to understand what kind of complex system a city is. Because, uh, well, as you know, and probably as, as people watching this know, at least since Plato and Aristotle, people have been debating what kind of system a city is and how should we deal with it in terms of policy or development infrastructure, et cetera. Should we want more cities, less cities, what kind of cities? What can actually some, like the mayor do to make the city better? If you think of the city primarily as a social network mm -hmm. that lives in space and time, and if you think then of, of the infrastructure as a way to enable its social economic activity, then you understand that there's a value to infrastructure, for example, in terms of allowing a more efficient use of people's time or, or, um, or, or costs in terms of doing what people do well, which is their social economic activity. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a sense in which one can start in some sense putting a value to what infrastructure actually does. Um, you know, and you see this uh, a lot in the history of urban planning in the last 60 years. You have cities that tend to be uh, very dense, and that's not good because people cannot move around and meet people that they might actually want to and get organized. And so those cities benefit essentially from having better infrastructure that allows movement not only of people, but also of things and, and information faster. But you also have then, in the, in, in the history of the United States more recently, cities that become too large in terms of infrastructure, mm. where the cost of just moving across, at least in time, if not in, in, in other forms, is quite, is quite high. And so those cities are just too diaphanous, too, uh, and, and they, 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 they cease to be easy places of human interaction. And mm -hmm. so the theory that I've developed just basically tells you a little bit what, is, what are the right compromises in terms of um, social interactivity and the characteristics of infrastructure and, and the structuring of space. The other answer is that this also allows us to put quantitative expectations as to what a city with certain characteristics like size and land area might do in terms of its wealth, or in terms of its innovation, or in terms of its amount of crime. Some of this is contextual because it depends a little bit on the history of the urban system, mm -hmm. but some of it depends on these general characteristics of cities. So that allows us to say a little bit how well a city is doing relative to its peers, if you wish. Um, one last question. So what, what's the most exciting thing you're working on now? So I, <laughs> so that, that's a hard question because you prefaced this by saying I work in too many things. <laughs> about them all. I didn't say that. Uh, uh, <laughs> So what's missing when you look at cities and human societies more generally is that even though we, start, we, we now have a, a reasonable understanding of the properties of cities versus size, we have a pretty poor understanding um, of the properties of cities in time. Mm. That's, that goes to many others. So I mean, how when, they evolve. And this is connect, sorry. Sorry, how they evolve. Over time? How they evolve over time, and this, of course, is all entangled with deep, deep questions like how, uh, how is the U.S. or any other country going to grow economically in this, in this coming year? Mm -hmm. Or is our society going to be more peaceful or less peaceful? Because basically what you find is that the properties of cities, which vary across sizes, are then integrated in terms of an urban system of cities of many sizes. And there are these flows of people and information that... Uh, that occur between all these places. And so it's important that when you have an idea in New York, uh, this idea is applied, for example, uh, is applied everywhere the way it can be useful. So when you develop computing in Silicon Valley, the wealth of creating that computing is not in the idea per se, but it's in the application of that idea everywhere, including all the way to farming mm. and agriculture and mining and primary activities. So that cascading of ideas and organizations all the way through a society is what most people think is going on when you think about economic progress, economic growth, but also growth of other things such as, uh, you know, improvements in public health and so forth. This is important in developed countries, but it's especially important when you go to developing countries where many of the properties of cities and, and, and human societies that we have in developed countries are not there yet.
Hmm. And so there's a question, for example, in terms of infrastructure and services. So there's a question about what is the path by which you can create these properties of, of, of human settlements in order to enable a self-sustained way of creating, again, social interactions, ideas, organizations that allow this system to go on and evolve and, and grow, at least economically. Okay. So that's a very important question, which has to do with economic growth and other things. And the other question is the question of creating, actually, a statistical theory of what cities are, so both for organisms, for cities, and for most other complex systems. Uh, for the brain and for many other systems, we have a very poor idea of, uh, of their statistical character. For example, all these scaling laws only give you an idea of what, they be, what a system behaves on the average, giving its size or any other characteristics. But when you look at you know, a particular creature or a particular city, it's, not always, it's, it's never that, quite that number. It's something around that. And so the question is, what creates these deviations? All these quantities behave a lot like, um, like fluctuations in the stock market, at mm -hmm. least in terms of their correlations. They're multiplicative processes. So they're hinting to what happens in, in a lot of social organizations, not just in cities, as being the result of processes. There are long chains of causation that are more like ends. So, you know, a city gets rich because you know, it attracted people and developed some infrastructure that allowed them to do what they do and discovered some technology and had finance and, um, you know, more people came. It's a long history of things that need to happen. They're all necessary in order to get to a certain place. And there are interesting um, theories that are all qualitative in, in, um, in the social sciences that try to express this and there are good candidates for explaining some patterns like crime or wealth and like, things like cumulative advantage and disadvantage and so I think I'm close to having a way of describing that statistically and therefore ending up with something that can actually make predictions where we might expect we know how wrong we may be and why. Okay, well that sounds really interesting so we'll mm -hmm. look forward to hearing more about that later. Sure. Okay, well thank you so much. Okay, okay. you're welcome. It's been